if anyone anywhere is talking about isometric RPGs and Baldur's Gate 2 is not in that conversation, it's not a good conversation. My goal with this one is to get you guys thinking about the fact that this is the granddaddy of isometric RPGs. It wasn't the first ISO RPG, but it's arguably the best ever. Baldur's Gate 2 has undeniably left its imprint on the genre, so if you haven't played it already, I want to try to convince you to take a step back into the past and get into this, even though it's 20 years old. First of all, I do have a Let's Play currently underway for Baldur's Gate 2. I'll pop the link to that on a card which should be up on the screen there. And I'm also working on a handy little checklist that'll help you through your adventures if you're thinking about playing the game. It lists every single weapon and armor, their locations, resistances, damages, and all that kind of interesting information to help you guys plot a path towards creating your ultimate character decked out in the best weapons and armor that they could possibly have. And that will be available to all of my patrons as soon as it's finished. And just a quick shout out to my current patrons. Thank you guys so much. If you'd like to toss a couple bucks my way, there's a link right there on the screen. Without you, I wouldn't be able to put the current time and energy into making all of this RPG content. You guys are legends. Okay, so let's just dive into why I think you should play this game, even now, 20 years after it's released. The first reason is legacy. If you go to Google right now, open up a tab and type in top 10 best isometric RPGs ever, I guarantee you Baldur's Gate 2 will be in that list. It's probably even in best RPGs ever made kind of lists as well. Now, the reason I say legacy is because for the last 20 years, Baldur's Gate and Baldur's Gate 2 have more or less become the shining example of what an isometric RPG should be. It has inspired Larian to pursue Wizards of the Coast in order to grant them the honors of making the sequel 20 years later. But it's also the game that inspired the development of so many other isometric RPGs. Pillars of Eternity, Pathfinder Kingmaker, of course the entire Divinity series. And many would argue that none of them have been able to eclipse it. But why? Because it was the first isometric RPG to combine so many elements that are core to a great RPG experience. And it's really that simple. When this game launched, there was nothing else like it. The second edition D&D skeleton underneath the game. The setting. All the voiced dialogue. A non-linear pathway to complete the game. A sheer staggering amount of replayability. And the chance to play as a completely evil character yet still have a group of companions that will not only support your villainry but cheer you along and maybe even get involved. The sheer depth that Bioware went to to explore these things pushed Baldur's Gate 2 into a place where it was pretty much untouchable. Back in the year 2000, I could not think of another RPG where two characters in my party had a heated conversation over a choice that I had made, which resulted in one of those party members murdering the other in his sleep. I woke up the next day and one party member was permanently removed from the team. Given that there are so many possible combinations of companions and parties in the game, that's one of the moments that, for me, clearly showed the depth that Bioware went to and it really hammered home just how phenomenal this game is. And also how truly different it was to everything else out there at the time. So let's take a look. We've got Dark Cloud, Dragon Quest 7, Pokemon Crystal, Paper Mario, Persona 2, Grandia 2, Final Fantasy 9, Vagrant Story, Deus Ex, Diablo 2, Might and Magic 8, Day of the Destroyer. Now, these are all fantastic RPGs, but nothing like Baldur's Gate 2. Now the year 2000 was a really interesting time for RPGs because most developers were already dipping their toes into the 3D realm. But there's Baldur's Gate 2, well and truly proving that a fantastic RPG doesn't need to be developed with bleeding edge technology, yet can still capture the hearts and minds of players worldwide. So when you develop a game that fundamentally changes and reshapes the boundaries of a genre, developers and gamers alike will subconsciously compare it with everything that comes after. The ultimate form of this today, and we all know it, is the term Souls-like. Demon Souls and ultimately Dark Souls are the quintessential games of that genre. And every other game that tries to dip its toes into the Souls-like realm is going to be compared with it automatically. 
So there you have it, Baldur's Gate 2 is the demon souls of the isometric RPG genre. The second reason is nice and short, it's price. Both Steam and GOG frequently have sales for this game. You can get the complete edition which includes two DLCs, Throne of Baal and the Black Pits 2 for about $5 to $10. I think normal price is anywhere from about $15 to $20, which is still a damn good deal. And incidentally, it is available on just about every platform now. You can get this game on the PS4, Xbox One, it's even on the Switch. And if you're a PC gamer, you'll be happy to know that the mod community is still active. So accessibility is no longer a problem either. The third reason is continuity. A lot of people don't realize this, but you can actually start and create your character in Baldur's Gate 1, play through the entire game, and then import that character into Baldur's Gate 2 and have that character's story continue. Now it's possible to do this in a lot of recent RPG franchises, Mass Effect, Pillars of Eternity and Dragon Age, but these games aren't 20 years old. So once again, we've got an example of something that just no other games were allowing you to do 20 years ago. Okay, so the fourth reason, and this pertains to all the physical collectors out there, it's the physical value for money. But let me tell you guys, if you manage to find a physical copy of Baldur's Gate 2 with all the manuals and stuff that came inside that box, you will not be disappointed. It is going to feel like Christmas. It was a cloth map. There was a manual that was like 200, almost 300 pages thick, listing spells and armor tables and weapon tables and combat tables and dexterity strength, intelligence tables, just all the stuff. It was almost like a, a stripped down version of a D&D player's handbook today. And this is the kind of stuff that really made you feel like you got your money's worth. I'm lucky enough to still own all of that stuff and man that manual is a chonky boy. The fifth reason is that Baldur's Gate 2 supports up to six player multiplayer. Six players. Man I don't even think that anybody has six friends anymore. But that's beside the point. The system is actually quite robust. First of all, there's no drama if you don't actually have six friends to play with. You see, the party size in Baldur's Gate 2 is six, and in this multiplayer system, you can assign three characters to one buddy and have three to yourself. You can also assign things like who has control over the pause button and set permissions so that your buddies can't steal loot out of your inventory when you're not looking. Now, the only caveat to all of this is the fact that you can't actually leave the area that your party is currently in unless you're all together. So if you're thinking about heading off into the wilderness and leaving your party behind, you just can't play like that in multiplayer. Now the sixth reason, I kind of touched on it briefly earlier, but it's replayability. Now there is a fairly linear path for the main storyline through Baldur's Gate 2. But what Bioware did so well was seamlessly inject lots of side quests to do with the companions that you have and the class that you chose to play as, and not only have those side quests be some short little fetch thing that you had to do for a companion to raise their affinity towards you, but have the outcomes of these quests be far reaching. So much so that you couldn't easily just go back and load a save and change your decision to see what happens because the decision was something that you made two or three weeks ago in the game. The other really big factor with replayability is back in the second edition of D&D, alignment was a really big thing. Your disposition towards NPCs and characters even in your party had massive influence over the outcomes and situations that evolved around you. If you're playing as quite a good aligned party, doing evil deeds can end up having players leave. And if you're playing an evil party, doing goody two-shoe stuff can have the same effect. But it's between these two extremes is where all the random stuff happens. If you start mixing evilly aligned companions with some good aligned companions, this is where you will truly realize how much effort Bioware put into this dialogue system as each NPC player that can be successfully recruited to your team has a list of other companions that they will either get along with or after seemingly being with them for five minutes will want to murder them. And it's quite a fun task as the party's leader to try and sort through this stuff as decisions you make can have effects such as characters permanently leaving the game world forever from decisions you made long ago or even go as far as one of your companions murdering the other. 
Now the final reason I've got for you guys today has everything to do with the fact that Baldur's Gate 3 is coming out soon and even though we don't have any concrete details from Larian about how the story from Baldur's Gate 2 ties into the story from Baldur's Gate 3, what we do know from Sven Vinke's own words and I quote, let me just say that we touch upon the story of Baldur's Gate 1 and 2 in a meaningful way. There are returning characters and what happened in Baldur's Gate 1 to and throne of baal leads to what happens in Baldur's gate 3. you won't necessarily see that at the start of the adventure but you will understand once you get further into the game now i'm not saying that you guys need to rush out and play Baldur's gate 1 and 2 in order to enjoy Baldur's gate 3 but i guarantee you fans of the series are going to be able to connect the dots and have a completely different and more meaningful experience when playing Baldur's gate 3. So that's it, you better go and check to see if it's on sale right now. I expect to see you guys in the multiplayer lobby of Baldur's Gate 2 within the next 5 minutes. If you're not, shame on you. Now one extra bonus reason for everybody who's made it to this point in the video, it's arguably the most critical and most important reason to play this game, Minsk and Boo. Minsk will be free! These bonds will not hold my wrath! Butts will be liberally kicked in good measure! I hope you guys have a wonderful day. I'll see you on the next one.